Welcome to the Inside Story with RLLC. Today, we will be talking to Dr. Tasha Malhotra about sensory integration. Hi, Tasha. How are you? Hi, Tristan, and thank you for having me today. Of course. We're so excited that you're here. I just want to start off with having you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Sure. Um, I've been a pediatric occupational therapist for 25 years. And my experience includes working with diverse pediatric populations in a variety of clinical settings, in addition to private clinic settings. And I've worked in home health care, early intervention, pediatric acute care, and outpatient rehab. But my most, my most beneficial learning happened in my first seven years working at Children's National Medical Center. And this is where I got the foundation for most of my skills impacting me throughout my career. Um, on a side note, I have a personal interest in volunteering internationally to educate where therapies are not available to families, and I've been part of projects in Haiti and Guatemala, and most recently I set up a sensory program and trained teachers in a school in Guatemala City just prior to COVID. Wow, that's awesome. So um, you talked about some of the stuff that you do, not necessarily locally, so if people were looking for you here, where are you located and also online, how can listeners find you? Um, our office is in Fairfax City, right next to Woodson High School, um, and we've been in this location since 2001, and we have a website that has all the information. Awesome. And what is the, what if I were to look you up, what's the website? Um, www.novaptherapy.com. Amazing. I'll put that in the show notes for everyone so they can find your website easily. Thanks. Of course. All righty. Well, let's just hop right into talking about sensory integration. So just to give us a really good foundation, can you explain what sensory integration means? Yeah. So sensory integration or also SI and also sensory processing, you'll see in different wording, um, is a term that refers to the way the nervous system receives messages from the senses and turns them into appropriate motor and behavior responses. It's that unconscious process in the brain, so the things that occur without us thinking about it, like breathing, um, that it organizes the information detected by the senses, uh, taste, sight, hearing, touch, smell, movement, gravity, position. Um, it gives meaning to what is experienced by sifting through all the information and selecting what to focus on. So such as um, a child listening to the teacher, but ignoring the noises out in the hallway and being able to focus on what they need to be doing. Adequate sensory integration allows us to act or respond to the situations that we're experiencing in a purposeful um, manner, so known as an adaptive response. So the adequate integration of sensory information forms that underlying foundation for academic learning and social um, behavior, which is so important to all parents. I mean, the most, um, the one thing we want to think about is there are eight sensory systems, and there are five that everyone knows, which is touch, smell, vision, hearing, and taste. But I also want to bring in the other three that we place a lot of focus on, and that's the vestibular and vestibular receptors are responsible for detecting changes in position and space balance, movement. So when you think about a child walking through the hallway, um, being able to balance and be able to know not bumping into other kids and bringing in the next one is the proprioceptive receptors, which provide information from body awareness, position, and posture. And then the last sense that I want to bring in is interception, which involves the internal regulation responses to our body, such as hunger, thirst, blood pressure, toileting, um, and this one's a very important one and a more newly introduced sense that we focus on because this is the one that tells you when it's time to eat or when it's time to go to the bathroom. And for kids who are too happy in life and don't want to eat their food or, or to forget to go to the bathroom until the very last minute and are, like, running through the house as fast as they can, these are the type of things that can interrupt functional activities. And throughout our lives, we're constantly bombarded with this information we receive through our senses, and we have to be able to successfully integrate it to make sense of it and form it into um, an appropriate response. And there are times when these responses we form don't match the information that we receive. 
So what happens when sensory integration, as you're discussing, doesn't develop properly? So this is when we have sensory issues that occur when a child has a difficult time receiving and responding to the information from their senses. So um, children who have sensory issues may have an aversion to anything that triggers their senses, such as light, sound, touch, taste, or smell. It's that inability to use the information received through their senses in order to function smoothly in daily life. So, for example, a child with a high threshold need in the movement system may be constantly on the move, so constantly wiggling, jumping, crashing, um, or a child in another area of sensory processing might be the opposite, where they they're misinterpret sensation and they have a low threshold. So even the smallest sensation can activate a protective response, such as flight, fight, or fight to sensation. So maybe if someone touches them on the shoulder, um, they might overreact and punch the child because, A, they might not know where they were touched because they're so under-responsive to touch, um, or they might feel like they were punched versus just a light touch. Wow. So how early can these sensory issues be identified? Oh, early detection is important, um, considering that developmentally children spend their early years of life experiencing and challenging their bodies and environment, and their minds are all constantly taking information received through touch, taste, vision, smell, and sound, and this stage in their development is crucial. So it lays that foundation with which the child gains the skills, self-confidence, and mastery or his or her body through development. So children express happiness in themselves and their world when development occurs as expected. So a child who shows these difficulties with these basic foundations, whether it be delays in coordination or communication, have been consistently shown to have problems in learning behavior and with their self-esteem. Okay. So what are some of the red flags that parents will observe in their children at home? So I wanted to talk about, I wanted to go ahead and also just mention school and home offer different areas of concern because some kids will hold it together in one place and not in another. So both must kind of be under, understood and addressed at the same time. Um, and, you know, just to, I feel like many families tell me that the child will hold it together at school all day. The teacher says there's no issues. Usually there are little things the teacher doesn't realize, but um that is impacting their academics, but and maybe they would be doing better in school. But main thing is, is they hold it together, and then the parents will say they get home, and they are just completely out of control when they get home because they just really wanted to be the child that their teacher wanted them to be at school. Um, but so just talking about red flags in general, I want to just say them across school, community, or at home. I think the things that you start to see is they're slow to reach those developmental milestones such as rolling, crawling, walking, so it starts early. Um, you see behavioral difficulties. There's frequent temper tantrums, difficulty with transitioning and transitions and change, um, more controlling behavior so that things go their way and feel, so they feel safe. Uh, maybe the kids who avoid the playground equipment because they don't feel safe getting off the ground or um, maybe they don't have the muscle strength to use the equipment. There might be more preference for sedentary play. Um, a lot of the kids I work with have poor motor control, so they have trouble with running or learning to do, learning to jump. They maybe avoid climbing equipment. These are the same kids who are impacting pencil grasp and having trouble with handwriting and keeping up with their class, and so they don't enjoy those type of things. There's, they might have lashing out behaviors in school where they are kicking other kids or um, biting. They might be children with poor attention and concentration um, or kids with just inability to follow instruction and complete tasks independently. Wow. Okay. So what role does OT or occupational therapy play in sensory processing disorder and sensory integration therapy? In sensory integration therapy, the focus of therapy is to provide the child with sensory experiences so they can start to make better sense of the sensory input from their bodies and from the external environment. And um, treatment requires continuous grading of activities to just to find that just right challenge, have the child have active participation and fun, 
and for the child to experience the sense of success. So sensory integration therapy focuses on four principles. Uh, we try to find that just right challenge. So whatever they're doing, that they can meet the challenge of the activity. An adaptive response that when we are giving them these challenges, that they uh, they're, they adapt their behavior to, to have the response we want to see. Um, active engagement, that they want to do the activities because they're fun. We're not forcing them to do them. And it's child-directed, that we're working towards activities that initiate therapeutic experiences within the session. And the child is more interested in leading those activities and attempting new things. Wow. Okay. So what might a therapy session look like then? We design sensory experiences specific to the child. So it might start with a certain form of sensory stimulation to elicit that desired response. While every session will be different depending on the child's needs, here's an example session with some sensory integration therapy activities. So it might start a treatment session with an obstacle course which the child views as fun and challenging. However, I would want the course to be carefully designed to provide sensory input to his or her joints and calming pressure to their body. Large motor physical activities are organized into the fences. And these are the things that we want to do before we start to get into activities that are harder for them. The purpose of the sensory stimulation is to regulate and prepare their system for the next activity. So maybe the next thing in, in their obstacle course might, that they, might be that they do a fun puzzle. However, the puzzle pieces may be placed in something, some wet substance, such as water beads, and they are a child that doesn't like their hands wet. So it might be that they have to put the puzzle pieces in, but since they're having so much fun playing the game, they might forget they're placing their hands into the thing that they don't like. And it's these sensory experiences that now the child is starting to adapt the hyper-responsibility to the messy textures. And common items we'll see in the clinic um, that you'll see in an OT clinic is they'll have swings, trampolines, brushes, scooters, it's just lots of equipment to offer these challenges so that we can have them enjoy the experiences and seek out new things and then fully start to make their body more comfortable in their environment. Very cool. So it sounds like by addressing these sensory issues, the child is better able to um, attend in the classroom so that they can learn new concepts a little bit better. Is that something you've seen in your work? So OT, the reason we provide sensory integration therapy is to create that sensory diet to regulate or provide stimulation to improve and maintain that optimal functioning. The sensory diet can be carried over from the from the school into the home and back and forth. And most importantly, when you talk about schools, we want the children to be doing these strategies also in their home environment so they can learn to be independent with them um, and be able to try them without someone always instructing them to try different activities. And a sensory support or sensory strategy is any equipment or technique that increases or decreases that sensory input to help a student focus and learn. So it could be something simple as having a child working on, when they're writing, maybe they're facing the wall so they're not distracted by other things in the classroom. Or a child who has trouble sitting in circle and they can't stay in their spot, they might have a weighted blanket on their lap to help them kind of find their personal space. And sensory strategies are designed to either help the student to increase their level of alertness or arousal or to reduce alertness. The goal of using sensory strategies is that we will help the student to reach that level of alertness. They need to attend and focus on their learning in class. Um, strategies like movement breaks and wobble cushions are typically designed to help increase alertness and focus. And then maybe strategies for calming space, um, having calming spaces or weighted blankets to help them decrease their arousal and to avoid that sensory overload. And a lot of um, families prefer to have activities also that don't make the child stand out. And I truly believe that every classroom should have sensory strategies. So there's many things that can be done in the classroom that the whole class is doing that can help just with regulating the whole class in general. And some, adapt and some adaptations within the school might include 
maybe having a sensory space. And some of these I'm going to talk about are a little bit more looking at the whole classroom. Everyone could be doing it, but, you know, whether or not it's also defined for a specific child. But having a sensory space, is there an area that they can go, like maybe a table with a blanket over it or or a little corner, uh, a beanbag corner where they can either go take a break, be calm, or it's an area where they can be active and do other activities there just to kind of re-regulate their system. There might be activities to provide touch and texture, so like Play-Doh, beads, stress balls, maybe moments where they can have those type of fidget toys. The classroom could have maybe altering lighting and offering natural or soft lighting or maybe just breaks in the day where the lights are off. It's always helpful to have classroom seating based on the child. So maybe some kids are better in the front of the classroom, other kids maybe in the back of the classroom. You can adjust chairs for optimal fit. Um, some kids respond to sitting. It helps to sit on a therapy ball or have some type of cushion on their chair, giving them sensory feedback if they're that child that likes to keep moving. Um, physical activities or sports in between classes, sometimes just getting the whole class up and moving, which, again, most teachers already start doing these things because they know they work. And having fidget toys, um, maybe large bands that are tied across the bottom of the desk that they can kick at or stretch or being able to stretch their legs while seated, maybe different putties that they can do during the day. And as we know, fidget toys are very popular now, so many mm -hmm. kids already have those. So that's awesome to hear that there are a lot of um, different techniques that the whole classroom can use. That is such, such a cool way to get the whole class involved and to help um, whoever's in need of sensory, um, kind of like other sensory integration um, activities. So now that we've talked about the classroom, I'd love to know what are good examples of activities parents can do at home to help with, help their child. Home programming is very important to me because I feel like after only having a, an hour a week with a child, it's not enough to really get things going. And most families, if they can work on the activities at home, they can incorporate it within their day. And it allows them to offer those appropriate sensory experiences throughout the day. And these are activities that should focus on bringing a child with low or high arousal levels to that optimal arousal level. Uh, before we can even address other functional areas impacted. So, for example, a child who has difficulty calming and focusing on any activity, we want to look at offering these proprioceptive, vestibular, or deep pressure activities so that we can help calm their system so that they can do the things we want to do. And I always think of the example of a baby that we automatically, when they're crying, we swaddle them, so we're giving them that deep pressure, and we rock them. And, you know, we're rocking them to give them that vestibular movement. Well, we're not doing it to put them to sleep. Well, maybe we are. But we're also, we're trying to do it so that they are able to engage with us and be in that good place. And this is kind of the things we need to think about when we're thinking of our own kids. Um, we want to do things that are heavy work activities. So helping moving something heavy through the house or pushing or pulling uh, a cart. Um, if you have a trampoline, a small trampoline in the house, jumping on the trampoline for breaks. Activities such as wheelbarrow walking are great, but this is where we want to really consider that we don't want to do those activities that are too hard on the child from a strength perspective or from a motor planning. So even though jumping on a trampoline is a great activity to do in your house or wheelbarrow walking, if a child has trouble jumping, then that's not a good calming activity. And same with wheelbarrow walking. If they are low muscle tone or they don't have the strength to hold the position, then that's not the activity we want to do. We want to find those activities that are going to be easy for them to do or easy for you to do with them. So even things like rolling them up in a blanket and rolling across them, you know, something where they don't have to use their muscle system. Um, maybe sitting on a therapy ball for intervals while they're playing a video game if they're allowed to play at some point. We want to make sure that, you know, can their body hold them up on a therapy ball, that it, it's something they can do in little intervals when they like doing it. Uh, there might be, you know, we want these sensory diets to fit what works for them and also can be help with the calming, uh, help calming them so that they can, again, do the things that we want to do. 
And just speaking of these different home activities and sensory diets in general, they're not just for kids with sensory issues. We need to remember that we all need the sensory input throughout the day, but most people naturally participate in these activities um, in a conscious or subconscious uh, in a way that meets their specific needs. And when you think about it, um, maybe you're sitting next to someone at work and they're constantly tapping their pencil while they're working on a report. Well, this is their sensory strategy of that's their way of regulating. Or maybe someone who paces while they're talking on the phone or maybe a teenager who jiggles their leg while watching a movie the entire time. That's a sensory strategy. Even having a big yawn every once in a while, it's a sensory strategy to alert or calm our system. It doesn't always mean we're tired. So our bodies know and our minds instinctively know that varying these sensory inputs allow us to function appropriately. And neurotypical children naturally seek out a variety of proprioceptive, vestibular, tactile input. But And as a result, they are able to accept and regulate sensory input um, where maybe a seam in their shirt doesn't bother them or during the classroom day, the windows are open, the noises outside don't bother them or whatever's cooking in the kitchen, the smell doesn't, it doesn't impact them. But kids who don't have that ability, that's where we have to do these sensory strategies where we want to help them be able to tolerate these, these different um, outside senses. Uh, if they can better tolerate them, if they can be in that calm state, they can better tolerate things. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is very helpful. I know that'll be very helpful to our parents. So I really appreciate you sharing those. And I think that was my last question for you, but was there anything else you wanted to share with us before we signed off? I think most importantly is, you know, it's hard to talk in a general sense of sensory integration. I think that just understanding your child and knowing, I mean, if a child doesn't, if they have something that bothers them, it might not functionally be an issue. You know, if they don't want seams and that's the only thing in their world, cut out all the t-shirt seams. You know, it's not the end of the world. It's just, it's really important as a therapist, we want to help those kids where it is impacting academic and social behaviors. And I think that um, most families are very well in tune to their kids and are already trying to incorporate things. And I do believe teachers also try their hardest to help. It's just sometimes um, just realizing that addressing that one thing that bothers them or those few things isn't necessarily always the answer is we really want to try to regulate their system before we start to get to those things. Wow. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on today um, and sharing all your wisdom because, like I said, I think it's going to be very helpful to parents and um, other people in the field that are listening, even some OTs that are just starting, that this might be helpful for them to hear. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much to the audience for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you know when we put out new episodes and leave us a little rate and review. Have a great rest of your day.